Hi, this is Trev and welcome to my blog. A short while ago I did a video titled MIG vs TIG welding on car bodywork and at the end of that video I asked you guys if there was any questions that you needed answering and to be fair there weren't too many which is really good because that means that I pretty much nailed that video fair and square. So in this video I'll be answering your questions. I'll put the more simple straightforward ones at the start and then we're getting to some more interesting stuff towards the end of the video perhaps throw in a few practical demonstration as well. I really hope that you enjoy this video. I think before we start it's just worth mentioning that I am not a professional welder and not a professional fabricator but I have however worked in the body repair industry for over 30 years. A couple of people are asking me about how to set up a MIG welder, how to set up a TIG welder, which type of gas do you prefer using with these different welders, uh, wire thicknesses. All these questions are answered in my back catalogue so it's all available to view on YouTube just go to my videos scroll back through you'll see that I've done basic MIG welding setup videos and TIG welding videos as well. One of the questions regarding the actual practice of welding is do I push or pull the torch when I'm welding? Well this question is going to differ depending on which welder you use. What they mean by this is if the torch is pointed in this direction, do you push it or do you just pull it back when you're welding? Well, if I'm TIG welding, invariably, I will always push the torch along. If I'm MIG welding, then I'm only ever going to be spotting the bodywork here and there. So you just need to be able to get a good view of the torch and the wire and where it's going to hit. And then I just give it a, a quick spot of weld and that's how I do my MIG welding on bodywork course we're not talking about fabrication we're talking about bodywork again. Car bodywork is very thin we're only talking 0.9 millimeters on an outer skin which is the main thing that you're going to be dealing with. At the end of the day you always use the gauge metal that that car is made out of. If, if it's made out of thicker gauge material then you use thicker gauge material to replicate what you're trying to repair. On the whole it's 0.9 millimeters for outer skin work which is as I said this is what we deal with mostly and I am talking about classic cars we are talking about mild steel you will never see on this channel me doing uh, tutorials on how to fit panels on modern vehicles that are made out of high strength steels and this is for a variety of reasons not least the fact that all these cars need to be repaired in exact accordance to methods of repair which uh, insurance companies have gone to great lengths with manufacturers to work out the best way of doing it and each car is completely different and this is why I won't get involved there's a lot of legal mess going on at the moment as well with repairing modern day cars if you've only got to have a car fail in an accident and they're going to be looking at the person who repaired that car as I said it's all getting a bit legal and heavy now. Another really quick one to answer, AC or DC TIG welder, which one should I get? You only need the AC side of the TIG welder if you're welding aluminium. So AC stands for alternating current, which means the polarity is constantly switched as you're welding to help you weld that aluminium it's all about the cleaning process so the polarity is constantly plus minus plus minus uh, set at a preset so you can actually adjust that and it's all about getting a clean weld on aluminium and you only need it if you're going to weld aluminium so if, an, if you're never going to weld aluminium don't get an AC DC welder just get a DC one a DC will weld everything else except aluminium a couple of people also have messaged me and I've received a lot of messages as well via email about this. They keep seeing these flash laser welders um, advertised. Um, a lot of these are very spoof advertisements, I hasten to add. You cannot buy a laser welder for £26. I can absolutely assure you of that. But uh, laser welders are used in vehicle manufacture, certainly. I mean, I remember seeing the first on the insides of the quarter panels on Volkswagen Golfs. When you lift the tailgate up you can see the little slits going along where they've just sort of burnt the outer skin into the inner frame. 
Um, I don't know anything else about it. Um, it's totally outside of my realm of understanding. So, um, and also, they, they are, I mean, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of pounds for these things. Hopefully, the technology will come down in price and they'll make it so that you can weld bodywork. But um, I don't know. I don't know anything more about it than that. So I'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Jack Hammer, my buddy Jack Hammer. How you doing, Jack? Love to dawn. Um, he wants to know about, he's seen people using filler rod, not using filler rod. Do you need it? Can you do without it? It's all about how tight you get your gaps. Again, we're talking classic bodywork, mod steel, coach building, as I've probably just mentioned about having the gaps really, really tight and then just fusing the metal together. If you can do that without too much of a void, that is a practice that is widely used amongst coach builders. I always add a tiny bit of filler myself just to fill in that little void. Uh, the main thing is it's penetrated from one side to the other. You don't want that undercut void too much if you can help it because obviously, you know, if there's less material there, there'll be uh, a slight weakness. But as I've said, car body work, as a crash, it all crumples up. Uh, the weld is not under as much stress certainly as a structure would be if uh, it were something like a bridge or a building. The different types of filler rod, uh, welding wire, there's lots of different grades. Again this is horses for courses, it depends what you are welding. I have had a few little bits of experience with this kind of thing, uh, mainly through people that I know that have gone off to do different things. My buddy Joe I used to work with is now extending uh, Toyota Land Cruisers in Australia. So he's gone from the UK to live in Australia and he works for a company that takes the body of Toyota Land Cruisers and then they add in quite a bit of chassis, um, weld it all back together and then make an extended cab. Um, absolutely fascinating and they use different types of welding rod because the chassis are made out of a very tough grade of steel and it's not a standard welding rod so there you go uh, it's always pays if you're going to do some a little bit exotic to go and have a look at what the because a lot of the manufacturers of these steel products will say this needs to be welded with a specific rod um, with you know a MIG welder or a TIG welder and it'll take you through the different processes. There is quite a lot of uh, info out there on technical data sheets to, to do with different profiles and different types of material. So always worth checking that out if you're going to start building a roll cage or something like that. So well worth checking out. Can you use a TIG welder for heat shrinking? Yes! <laughs> I've done a video. I actually showed how it is possible to tighten up some metal by using the TIG welder. Just turn it right down so it's not scarring the metal on the outside. You just need a oh, very, very small amount of amperage just to inject some heat into that area and it will work as um, quite an effective heat shrinker. In fact, if you're in the process of welding something and, and you see a little high spot, it is really handy just to go over and just zap it, give it a tap. Just bear in mind you need to turn it down otherwise you're going to go over and blow a big hole in it. So that's uh, something I've fallen foul to a couple of times. So yes, it can be used for that process. Another interesting question, are cheap welders any good? No right or wrong answer to this. Certainly no yes, no answers will answer this question. I've got lots of information I could lay upon you now, but I'll be just going on a big rant for about half an hour and that's not what this video is is all about but I'll throw a few things at you to make you think differently about possibly what you already believed I mean there is this terrible knee-jerk reaction to anything built in China these days uh, from any other country it's uh, certainly really really frowned upon but um, 
I have different perspectives on this. Certainly if all the components that were manufactured in China were withdrawn from welders and aeroplanes and cars and everything else, everything would cease to operate because virtually everything now like that is manufactured of course in China. So we can't just say blanketly it's all a load of rubbish because it certainly isn't. There's good and bad in all manufacturing, isn't there? I was working at a Vauxhall main dealership a long time ago. I've been left for over 10 years now. Um, so this could have happened about 15 years ago. Uh, we had a welder uh, delivered to the workshop, a new welder to replace the old worn out one and it's a manufacturer in the UK. I won't say the name of the manufacturer because I'm only about 90% sure it was that manufacturer and we are talking a long time ago so I'm a little bit sketchy but I have got the story pretty much logged in the old memory bank and it goes something like this. A TIG welder that they produced was copied in China and it was basically, I think, kind of banded about that this welder was a replica of this really, really smart welder that this company produced. So they managed to get a hold of one and took it apart to see what was what inside. And of course, everything has to be produced. If you're going to produce something that's going to be cheaper, you have to take something away. And they said that although this welder welded quite well, one of the problems was that there was no protection between the printed circuit boards, meaning if there was a power surge or something like that and it blew one of the components on the board, that damage would just spread throughout the whole of the welder and it would be unrepairable. So up until the point that it went wrong, it would probably weld okay, but then you have this situation of a little power surge or you overload the welder or something like that and the whole thing is completely ruined. Whereas a lot of uh, reputable welding manufacturers now offer repairs on welders um, and, and warranties as well. This is the other thing. If you buy something from a country abroad and you have to post it back there, how much is that gonna cost to return it and are they gonna follow through on their promise to repair it or replace it or whatever. I don't know. I mean, it's not something that I personally would want to get involved in. I'll probably buy something cheap and then just accept that when it goes pop, it's fit for the dustbin, to be quite honest with you. So you've got to sort of weigh up whether a three year or a five year, even in some cases, uh, manufacturer's warranty is that worth that few extra hundred pounds you're going to pay? If you're going to keep that world a long term, then it almost definitely is, isn't it? If you think about it. The other way that they save money on these welders is they do things like saying that its output is far higher than it actually is if it was put under load and tested on a proper machine that tests its output. If they say it's a 200 amp welder, it's probably closer to 120 amp. You get what I'm saying? It's not as powerful as I saying, so there's not a like to like comparison. Also the duty cycles often on these machines aren't quite what they're cracked up to be. Now basically duty cycle means, say you had a, a 200 amp welder, you wound it all the way up to 200 amps, you welded constantly for 10 minutes, non-stop, and it had a 60% duty cycle. Then you'd only get to six minutes and it would overheat and shut off. That's what it basically means, the duty cycle if it says it's 60% duty cycle and it's actually only 30, that's going to make a big difference, isn't it? If you can only wow for three minutes before it shuts off. And these figures will be very, very much manipulated on a product that it comes with no name on the side. It's not from a reputable company, etc., etc. Hopefully that answers that question. I know people that have bought cheap stuff and to be honest with you, I've been astounded at how well it actually welded and other stuff is completely diabolical. I mean, a lot of the MIG welders, one of the biggest frustrations isn't the power output, it's the wire feed. If you've ever used a welder with a dodgy wire feed, then 
you know exactly what I'm talking about where the wire speeds up and slows down or snags up in the machine and all the wire spools up inside the machine it's hard enough learning the processes and getting it right yourself without using a product that isn't working properly so that's my point of view on it I know it's not a black white answer but there is no black and white answer to this one is there I often have questions about using flux core welding wire on MIG welders. It's something that I've never used and um, I don't really intend uh, using it, not even giving it a go for the sake of it really because I can get gas quite readily and as far as I'm aware uh, gas on a MIG welder will produce a far superior weld to anything that's flux cord so I can't really see the point of going down that road but one interesting question that somebody put to me was I want to convert from flux cord to use an argon shield and um, how do I go about changing the polarity of the welder because with uh, a flux core of course it's um, positive earth not negative earth which it would be if you were using argon shield. So if you open up the welder's cabinet, you'll normally see inside a strap inside the cabinet. What you've got to do is just swap these two over to change the polarity of the earth on the welder. And most welders come with this feature. Some you may actually have to unscrew the side off. It may not be inside where the welding wire is. So you might just need to go the other side of course disconnect it from the mains first safety first guys somebody also asked me about heat shield studs and when they snap off now this isn't really along the subject of welding car bodywork exactly but i'll give you something that you could do as a bit of a as a bit of a fix so if you found yourself in this situation uh, i know a lot of people get a bit frustrated about this when they snap off and you don't have a stud welder to re-weld it back on. Putting my thinking cap on, you can use a MIG welder for this. Grind it off flush, clean it up obviously if it's snapped off, clean it off flush, get it so that it's in the same place or just to the side of it because normally it's a pretty vague hole isn't it in a heat shield, it's normally pretty, pretty massive so you could go to one side slightly. Just drill a hole just big enough so you can get that stud through, then you can push the stud through, MIG weld it from the inside of the car, just focus the weld on top of the stud, not on the bodywork. Get the weld on the end, a blobby weld, and it will literally just keep melting until it gets into the bodywork and it melts itself onto the bodywork. That's one way you could do it, or another way if you didn't want to end up kind of like destroying all the paintwork on the car, because this is what's going to happen if you start welding the car. Something else you could do is cut a, a nice sort of square of material uh, out of some steel, uh, drill the small hole in it, weld the stud to that, and then you could use some two-pack epoxy adhesive, like structural panel bond. So you want to get that to nice sort of bright steel with an angle grinder or a belt sander, and then actually bond that plate underneath this way you don't burn all the paint on the inside of the car so when you lift the boot floor carpet up it's not a great big sort of rusty patch or bare metal that you've got to respray you could just leave the manufacturer's coating on there and um, just under seal around from underneath and that's a way that you can fix these studs without destroying the vehicle's paintwork somebody else made a really really interesting and clever observation about MIG welds being harder than TIG welds. Ooh, you're hard. And they said that I've mentioned this before in other videos and then I've gone ahead and used some MIG welding wire as filler rod when I'm TIG welding and then I expressed that the weld is softer than it would have been if it was MIG welded. And this is true of course I'll explain the reasons why this is the case. There's a few different principles at work here. If we're talking about hardening steel, iron of course is steel without the carbon added to it. So you add carbon to iron to make steel. 
and the more carbon that is added to steel the more potentially hard you can make that uh, material and of course there's other things that are added to steel the hardest one that is in cars on modern day cars is boronated steel so boron steel incredibly hard this is something that i find really really interesting so if you're talking about heat treating metal then it has to be made from the correct material in the first place so it has to have a specific carbon content or another component added to that steel that's going to give you the hardness but not just adding that gives you the hardness because there's also a thing called heat treatment heat treatment is where that component or that object is raised to a certain temperature maybe held there for a prolonged amount of time and then rapidly cooled and this is how metal is made harder and stronger it's all to do with the heat treatment process and when we're welding something we're always kind of mimicking these processes so you might be welding a piece of mild steel but that filler rod that you're adding may have a component that will make that weld joint harder if you see what i'm saying so when we're tig welding the tungsten tip is providing the heat needed for the weld electrons bombard the workpiece and the base metal so the surrounding metal around the weld joint gets hot it increases in heat so it gets hotter and hotter and hotter until it gets to a stage where the two pieces of metal fuse together or you start adding filler rod and that filler rod melts and it all fuses together creating your welded joint when you remove the heat so you take your finger off the trigger let the tig welder off then of course it cools down but the base metal surrounding it got hot first there's a great deal of heat you see in the base metal and the welded joint so the whole thing slowly cools down when we're mig welding the filler rod itself so the welding wire is the electrode so the electrode comes out hits the workpiece and instantly welds it's a very very fast process not allowing the base material around the welded area to get hot so it's essentially a very hot weld on cold base metal which means that that base metal surrounding that weld is very very cold and it just wicks the heat out of that weld so it sucks the heat out cooling it down very rapidly so i've got some really really interesting short video clips for you to watch here i've got the same sample of metal divided into three so all three samples are exactly cut from the same piece of metal now this is higher carbon content than mild steel so it is higher so that means it's more susceptible to heat treatment so i've got three samples the first sample i won't do anything to the second sample i've put it in the coals in my fire and got it up to temperature so it glows red hot and i've just left it in there and what this means is it was held for a prolonged length of time in heat and allowed to cool really really slowly so this is an annealing process the other sample i've heated it at really really hot with my oxygen acetylene welder and then plunged it into cold water so this is kind of like a really really aggressive hardening process i put the three samples in my vise and just literally bent them backwards and forwards to witness how these different processes affected the material so as you can probably guess the one that was annealed bent backwards and forwards multiple times the sample that i didn't do anything to at all bent backwards and forwards a lot less times and the one that i hardened snapped straight off as soon as i put any pressure on it as it was incredibly brittle so talking about weld strength because people keep talking about stronger is better stronger isn't necessarily better stronger is only better until it breaks this should be quite an interesting practical experiment i've got a piece of mild steel cut in half i'm going to buzz it back together again with a mig welder i've got to get at the most obscure angle to be able to film it and weld it so it will be at a bit of an odd angle and then we'll move on to the next process
So this is the top side, spotted along. Not the neatest job I can appreciate. Warped like a pig as well, of course. The underside, good penetration all the way through. So this essentially would be a weld that would hold together, no problem. What I'm going to do as part of this experiment is grind the back off. I've ground this off so that it lies flat on this piece of metal. See how hard those MIG welds are in comparison to the base metal because they're not affected by being hit and they've put extreme dents in this other piece of metal they put on the top. See it's trying to come up through the other side. The next thing I'm going to do is fire the TIG welder up. I'm going to run the TIG welder across this. I've got my TIG welder fired up. I'm not going to go too mad, just 20 amps, nice slow pass. There we go, much flatter weld, almost looks like a gas weld doesn't it? Large heat affected zone as well because it was such a slow pass. I'm going to just leave this to cool off on its own now no compressed air or anything to help the cooling down process just let it cool down really slow and then this area should now be annealed what i'm going to do now is punish the weld out with a standard weight panel hammer and we should see this flattening out i don't think that this is going to be as soft as if i TIG welded it right from the start and this most certainly isn't a recommended welding procedure. This is just an experiment to show you that this is indeed a MIG weld that's been annealed with a TIG welder to make it softer. So let's just see if that is softer. If that was still MIG weld there's no way that that would flatten out. As I said it will be a little bit harder than if I TIG welded it right from the start. This isn't a recommended procedure because you basically multiple passes weld in the same area you're just going to weaken the metal so it's not an advised sort of procedure this well the panel hammer has been unaffected by hitting those welds and the welds are certainly a lot softer than they would have been had they just been MIG welds. So we can see that they're flattening off quite nicely with just a couple of passes. I'll just give this a bit more of a fettle, see if I can get them a little bit flatter. There we go, well flattened out. The nail isn't even picking the weld up now. I had to give it a bit more stick, but just goes to show how soft it is now. I might just put a scotch bright wheel across that, see what it looks like. So that's the top side. That's the underside, untouched. Well, thanks very much for watching. That's all of your questions answered. Well, the ones that I've got an answer to anyway, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Things are going okay here. I'm getting my new outbuilding built, which will allow me to produce more videos for this channel. Um, so you will be seeing a bit more of me soon, and I hope to sort of try and keep some momentum up. It will be so much easier making videos when I've got a bit of space back because things have been pretty full and hectic around here for the last few years. Anyway, until next time, I shall say. Bye for now.